Good morning, Maliga. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, mm-hmm. 
later online. We appreciate having you here also. Got a few updates for you. Uh, the men's breakfast for the soul has been rescheduled for this Saturday, March 19th at 7.30 a.m. All men and boys are welcome. Um, again this Sunday we took up an offering for the Ukrainian humanitarian relief effort. 100% of that goes to the UMCOR. Um, the baskets were passed around, so if you wasn't sure what that second basket was, I apologize. I should have jumped up and announced, but if you didn't put in and you want to, the baskets are back there if you'd like to do that. Um, a reminder is next Sunday, March 20th, Pastor Mike and the leadership team invite you to attend an informational gathering between worship services. That'll be 1015 to 1050, so that'll be the first service and second service. Uh, they'll have more information about the current theology divide in the United Methodist Church and options for separation. They'll have more information about the Global Methodist Church. Questions will be welcomed and we'll process them together. And most of all, we'll seek God together in prayer. Again, this informational gathering next Sunday here at 1015, right here. Our events ministry team is offering lilies to you at cost this year. Please use the form in the bulletin and place it in the correct amount in a clear folder in the sign-up table. <coughs> A uh, reminder, Pastor Mike's on vacation this week. Um, I'm not sure if he had anything to do with the baseball um, thing, but if you did, thanks, Mike, but I'm not insinuating. <laughs> Children third grade and under can leave for Children's Church, and that's all I got. Have a blessed day. Specifically um, for a few special requests, I just wanted to give you um, an update before we pray so you know um, what we're praying about. Um, um, first of all, we're going to be praying for two Western Brown students. One is a kindergartner at Hamersville, um, the building where I teach, um, and the second is um, from Western Brown High School. Um, Hunter McKenzie is the high school student. And Jordan Reithford, I'm sorry, um, is the kindergartner. And both have received um, a cancer diagnosis um, just recently this week. And um, their families are, of course, surrounding them. They're feeling community support. Um, we just want to make you aware so that you can begin to pray for those two children um, as their families and them make decisions about um, the next course of care for them. Um, we'll also be praying for um, Dolores Brooks, who um, is in hospice care, has been for a little while, um, and is probably near the end of her days, based on what I understand. So um, but those are the reasons um, that we're praying, and that's who those people are um, when we pray together. So if you would join me this week um, in lifting those people up um, as we go through the whole week, but today we'll be praying together. Would you pray with me, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today, Lord, humbled and grateful to be in your presence, Father. We just thank you for um, the privilege of being able to gather together as a congregation, Father, to worship you, to bring honor and glory to your name, Father. We ask this week, Father, specifically that you would make your presence known in the lives of of Hunter and Jordan, Lord, that they would fill your presence, that you would comfort them with your spirit, Lord. Please be with their families and their medical teams, Lord, as they try to work through um, possible treatment plans. Father, we just pray for your healing touch, Father. 
We know that you're a God of miracles, Father, and we just pray. If it be your will, there will be miracles in these cases, Lord. Father, we also lift Dolores Brooks and her family to you, Lord. What a remarkable woman and what a woman on this earth, Lord. Please let her feel your presence. Comfort her family as she looks forward to the day where she gets to see you, Father. And we lift the people of Ukraine. Be with them, Lord, in their suffering. Be with them, Father, where they can feel your strength. Reveal yourself to them in a new way, Lord. You can bring them comfort amidst the chaos, Lord. These things, Father, when we think about them, seem so big. But we know, Lord, that you're in control. And so we turn them over to you, Father, because we know that nothing is too big for you. Father, we give you the glory and the honor for everything that happens in each of these situations, Father. We pray that you will go before us with this message, Lord. May it be seated into our hearts, Father, so that it can produce good fruit for your glory, Lord, and for your kingdom, Father. It's in your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. So today is going to be the second message in the series that Pastor Mike began last week. It's called The Last Day Before the Best Day, which is a little bit of a mouthful. So we're looking at the last day before the best day. Today we're going to be looking again into the Gospel of Mark. We're going to be looking at the time that Jesus spent in the Garden of Gethsemane. And for me, the passage we're going to be looking at is uh, probably one of the most troubling portions of Passion Week for me. Um, as I was growing up, my aunt had given me this postcard when I was a little girl. I didn't even really know how old I was, and I, I held that little postcard as a treasure. I don't, I don't know why it was so special to me, maybe because it was a picture of Jesus. But it was a picture of Jesus praying in the garden. And it was one of those, um, I don't know if you grew up in the 70s and early 80s, you may know what I'm talking about. It was like you hold up the picture, and if you turn it a certain way, then the picture shifts a little bit, kind of holographic a little bit. Like, you get one picture when you put it this way, and you turn it a little bit in the light, and the picture changes a little. Um, anybody remember those? Okay, like I'm, I'm, I'm aging myself probably, right? You might not even know, who, some of you young kids don't even know what I'm talking about. But anyway, they were really cool. But she gave me, and it was Jesus praying in the garden. He's, he's on his knees. He's over this rock. And, and a, there's a, a moonlight shining down. And when you would turn the picture, the moonlight would shift a little, right? And this picture was beautiful. It was beautiful. And I had this image in my mind of Jesus praying in the garden as this nice, peaceful, pleasant time he spent with the Father. Because to me... My young heart, that's what that picture revealed to me, right? That's what, that's the image that was planted in my head. Until I got a little bit older and really started to learn to understand the scripture for myself. And I found out that that picture really gave me a false image of what was really going on that night in the garden. And that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to spend time um, thinking about Jesus' prayers in the garden. See, what gets me about this, it's not that pretty picture that my aunt had given me that I treasured for so long. See, that night in the garden, our Lord experienced anguish beyond anything that we can ever imagine. Anguish and despair. And what really gets me is that the anguish and despair that he went through that we read about him going through. As I got older, I realized that it's because of me. It's because of me. So the word Gethsemane actually means olive press. 
and an olive press is, if you're trying to get valuable olive oil out of an olive, do you know how you get that? You press it, right? They press it, they smash it, they crush it, and then the oil comes out. And the oil is very valuable in this time. They used it for so many different things. So the name Gethsemane itself is symbolic to that pressing and that crushing the dread that was ahead for Jesus. See, this is an amazing story because it showcases Jesus' humanity, but it also displays his steadfast love for us and his obedience to the Father. So we're going to look together today at Mark 14, verses 32 through 42. I'll give you a minute if you're trying to find that. Mark 14, 32 through 42. And they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch for one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know how to answer, what to answer him. And he came a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. We know from reading both Luke and John that during the final week of Jesus' life, Jesus and his disciples had been coming into the city of Jerusalem, then going back out to the little town of Bethany nearby. So they're coming and going. And it become kind of a pattern for Jesus during this time, that on his way out of town, when he's headed back to Bethany, he would stop at the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. No doubt Judas realized this. And by the time we get to the text that we just read here this morning, Judas has already gone out. He's already making the final arrangements with the Sanhedrin on where, when, and how they would take Jesus. Now, as far as Jesus and the disciples go, they had just come out of the upper room. They had just had the Last Supper. And Jesus had just washed their feet. It was a time of close camaraderie. It was a time of fellowship. It was a time of celebration. Remember this Passover was a celebration of a rescue from being rescued from Egypt. Once they headed out, Jesus told all of the other disciples except for Peter, James, and John to stop at a certain place while he goes ahead to pray. So the four of them go a little bit further and deeper into the garden. And then Jesus looks at Peter, James, and John, and he tells them to wait. 
he then himself alone goes a little further in. He goes in there to pray. When he gets in, he falls down to the ground. That's what Mark tells us. He also says that Jesus was greatly distressed and troubled. Jesus is told Peter, James, and John, his soul is very sorrowful. So something major has shifted. Let's think about this. From the time they left that upper room and the celebration that was there to the time they reached the garden, and Jesus says, my soul is very sorrowful. The men had just experienced celebration and joy. Now, shortly after, the mood has shifted, and Jesus is greatly distressed and troubled. When he's alone, he drops to the ground and prays. See, it was customary during that time when the Jews, when they prayed, they stood. Here we read that Jesus fell to the ground to pray. See, this moment was different from all others. So Jesus falls to pray. Well, let's think about what prayer is really all about. Why do we go to God in prayer? Is it because we want something? Is it because we need something? We need help, right? That's often our motivation to pray. But underneath that, we're also saying, God, I want this, and I can't get it unless you do something. Or, God, I need this, but it's not going to happen unless you give it. God, I need your help. God, I need your strength. God, I need your deliverance. I need your guidance. Right? So prayer, if we're praying correctly, it's a confession from us about our deep dependence on God. When we pray, we're saying we need his help. We're saying that we need his strength. We need his enabling sovereign power to do something that we need done or for something that we need moved in our lives. That's us, but this is Jesus. This is Jesus, he's the second person in the Trinity. This is the one who by him and through him, everything was created. This is the Lord that we're talking about here. He's the one who walked on water. He fed 5,000 people with somebody's tiny little lunch. Right? He's the one who healed the sick. He cast out demons. He even raised Lazarus from the dead. He did so many miraculous things. However, here he is, fallen on the ground, praying. When he most wanted and needed intimacy with his father, all that he got in return was a foreshadowing of the wrath of God that was to come on the cross. Gethsemane was a foretaste of that wrath. See, we need to understand something that's both a doctrinal truth and a theological truth. See, Jesus was 100% God, like we just talked about, right? He's the second person of the Holy Trinity. 100% God. But also, even though my little earthly tiny brain has a hard time figuring it out, he's also 100% human. I don't know how that's possible, but it's the truth, right? See, he was born of a woman. He ate food for nourishment and sustenance. He slept when he was tired. He had an entire range of emotions that each one of us experiences. And here we are seeing his humanity on display. Here he is coming to God the Father, just like he's done every other day of his life. And he's praying. He's asking the Father to strengthen him. He knows what's ahead. He's asking God to help him 
to fill him with his spirit, which he knows he's going to need in order to take the next steps. He's going to need help desperately because of what's about to take place over the next 24 hours. See, in the next 24 hours, he's going to be railroaded into a kangaroo court falsely accused. He's going to be kept awake and harassed. He's going to be beaten to a bloody pulp and mocked. Spit on. He's going to be whipped until his back is shredded. He's going to be hit in the face with a stick and a rod. He's going to have a crown of thorns shoved into his scalp and forehead until the blood pours from the wounds. And then he's going to be forced to carry a heavy cross down a road where crowds are going to be gathered. And again, they're going to mock him. They're going to spit on him. They're going to laugh at him. And then he's going to be nailed to that same cross that he carried. And he's going to be lifted up for everyone to see naked. The humiliation is simply unimaginable. And all those things are horrific. However, that's not even the worst part. See, all of these things I just described are the physical traumas that he knew were coming. We haven't even gotten to the spiritual ones yet. See, what the disciples didn't realize while they slept and relaxed is that there was a spiritual battle taking place. You better believe the devil was involved in this. He'd already entered into the heart of Judas, worked out the betrayal. You can be sure that once he was finished with Judas, that he showed up in that garden to tempt Jesus. See, ever since Jesus was born, the devil had been doing everything he could to get Jesus to not go through with God's plan, right? He tried to have Herod kill him when he was about two years old. When Jesus began his public ministry, if you remember, he promised to give Jesus, Jesus all the kingdoms of the world if he would just bow down and worship him. Satan even tried to use Peter to sidetrack Jesus. And I'm sure he was probably right there in that garden as Jesus was on his face praying. You don't have to go through this, Jesus. Just let man die. Are they really worth it? The distress is real. Mark describes it by saying that Jesus was greatly distressed. And in the original Greek, if it would be translated word for word, it would say Jesus was filled with horror and dread concerning what was about to take place. You see, as bad as the beatings and the mockings and being nailed to a cross are, it's nothing compared to the spiritual reality that was about to happen. Something far beyond what the eye could see was taking place here. What Jesus was about to experience was his Father's hand lifted up in judgment and wrath. You see, that's what takes place on the cross, right? While Jesus' physical body is hanging on that cross, God the Father is going to pour out his wrath and his judgment on his Son. All that wrath and judgment that we've stored up because of our sin, past, present, and future. And as he hangs on that cross, all of those sins that we've stored up are going to be laid on him. And it's going to cause him to be separated from the Father. It's going to cause Jesus to say, my God, my God, why? Why have you forsaken me? And the wrath of God and the anger of God and the justice of God is going to be exacted on the Son. 
because of me. See, in the garden, Jesus already knows what's coming. Just the thought of it, just the thought of it, causes him to be filled with horror and dread. The thought of being separated from his father, the thought of enduring the wrath of God Almighty, drove him to fall down in front of the father and pray until droplets of blood came from his pores instead of sweat. And he says, if it's possible, Father, if there's any other way, please let this cup pass from me. Man has sinned, has sinned against the sovereign creator of the universe. The people who were mocking Jesus the people who were beating Jesus, the ones who were spitting on Jesus. It's a picture of all of us. And God is perfectly just, and he cannot deny himself. If God does not exact justice, if he lets the cup pass, then he ceases to be God. He's not only perfectly just and righteous and holy, but he's also loving and merciful and gracious. He longs to show his love, his mercy and grace. And so, since God cannot deny himself, he cannot simply forego justice and let this cup pass, someone has to pay for man's sins. But since he's loving and merciful, he himself undergoes that justice and pays the price in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. And that's why I said at the beginning of this message, this passage of scripture really messes with me. To know that a sinless God is brought to the point of this kind of anguish because of me and the things I've done. So Jesus is greatly distressed. He's troubled about what's going to happen. It's understandable. And there are his disciples, you know, these guys who said, we're with you till the end, Jesus. Yet they can't even stay awake to pray for an hour. You know, they just had the Last Supper. You guys know how hard it is not to take a nap after you have a big meal, right? Well, they were experiencing that in their humanness. And because of their humanness, Jesus had to go through this whole process alone. <coughs> and he asks if it's possible, please let this cup pass. But then look at what he says. Yet not what I will, but what you will, Father. See, if we had to sum up the life of Jesus in one word, what word do you think you would pick? I'll let you think about that for a minute. Hold that word. What word would you pick to sum up the life of Jesus? One word. Maybe some of you thought of the word love. I think that's a good description. Right? We know... There's no greater love than a man who does this, lays down his life for another. We know that God so loved the world that he gave his only son. But I think there's another word that might work as well, and that word is obedient. Jesus' whole entire life was one of perfect obedience to his Father. He says, I have come to do the will of him who sent me. But really, those two words go hand in hand, don't they? Jesus loves not only us, but he loves his Father. And he loves Father so much that he's going to obey his will no matter what the cost. Obedience and love are like two sides to the same coin. 
In John 14, 15, Jesus says, If you love me, love, you will keep my commandments, obedience. So we see in today's passage that Jesus has anguished over all of this. He's prayed about it three times, is what the scripture says. He returned three times. He's trying to work through this. And finally, he came to the point, he's just totally turned it over to the Father. It's your will, not mine. And he resolved to go forward. This isn't just lip service when Jesus says, not my will, but thy will be done. He's totally resolute in moving forward with the mission. And he's totally aligned his will with the will of the Father and was perfectly willing to go to that cross for us. It's mind-blowing when you think about it. Him just willingly going to that cross to suffer for people who don't even love him. People who don't care about him. And he even went to the cross for people who are enemies of God. He does that in order that those same people have a chance to be reconciled back to God. Even though they spit on him, even though they yell at him, even though they ignore him, and even for the ones who deny his very existence. Because without his suffering and without his sacrifice, without his obedience, we would be helpless. We have no chance to be reconciled and made right with God. None of us, no matter how nice we are, no matter how hard we work, no matter how many good things that we do, without Jesus, we don't have a chance to be right before God. How is it possible that he can love us that much? Hebrews 12, 2 tells us that Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him, the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now seated at the right hand of the Father. So he saw the horror of the Father's wrath being poured out on him. He saw the separation between himself and God because of the sins that would be laid on him. And it all gave him great anguish. But do you know what Jesus did? He saw past it all. He didn't put his focus on the things around him or the troubling things ahead. He saw past it. He saw the joy that was set before him. He saw himself seated at the right hand of God. He saw all of those who would be saved he saw them receiving God's grace that would only happen if he acted in obedience. He saw his father glorified in the saving sacrifice of himself. And in Matthew 16, 24, Jesus tells his disciples that if anyone comes after him, that would be us, they should take up their cross, deny, deny themselves, and follow him. He's telling us that we should do what he did. See, I'm not saying the way we suffer can't be emotional, can't be sad, because it is. But we can't let our sufferings and our troubles and all that surrounds us in this chaotic world get in the way of everything that God has for us. See, our Suffering and our trouble can't be our focus. God has to be. When we focus everything on our sufferings, see, we're looking around. We're looking at our sufferings. And we sit down our cross. And we get stuck there. See, that's dangerous ground because that's when Satan moves in, just like he tried to do with Jesus. He tries to use our emotions and our situations to lure us to lose our faith. See, if we keep our cross, if we carry that cross, God will help us 
through those emotional times. He will help us through every weakness and every temptation. He will not leave us in our despair because he's the answer to everything in our lives. See, sometimes we just have to say, not my will, but yours be done, Father. We need to pick up our cross, and we need to keep going, keeping our eyes focused on the good that's set before us. Suffering is hard, but we have to remember to trust who God is. We have to trust that he has a plan, and he will always, always always lead us to what is best for us. See, our pain, our sufferings, and our problems, they're not forever. They will end. They may return in some way, but God is steadfast, and his faithfulness is never ending, and he will walk with you through that valley until you get to the joy that's set before you if you keep your eyes on him. Will you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, we know that you will take all of our suffering, all of our agony and trouble, that you will give us strength to walk through each of them, Lord. I pray, Father, that you would teach us as we walk through them that you would lead us and that we would walk. I pray that we would not set our cross down, but we would go your way. We know you're faithful. We put our lives in your hands and we trust in you to get us through. It's in your holy and precious name we pray. Amen.
day, we go forward not looking around us and our sufferings and our troubles, but let's fix our eyes on the joy that's set before us, where Jesus promises to meet us. He is faithful, and he will be faithful to you this week if you seek him. I hope you have an amazing week.